Welcome to the Help Me With HIPAA podcast. My name is David Sims of HIPAA for MSPs and Security First IT. And joining me for the first time ever as a co-host, we have Gary Salmon, <laughs> Black hey. Talent Security. What's up, Gary? How are you, man? Good to see you again. So, so Donna went MIA on me. Uh, <laughs> yeah. she sold us out. She calls it vacation. I don't know. But uh, so we decided to do something we've never done before. And we wanted to bring somebody else in as kind of a a guest and a co-host all at the same time. So, uh, so we were going to abuse Gary in that role. And, uh, so today we're going to talk a little bit about, uh, actually we'll talk a lot about why it and cybersecurity are not the same. So if you are an MSP, that might be something you're struggling with. I know for my, uh, company, it's hard to even call it MSP anymore because we're not truly an MSP, but we're not truly an MSSP either. We're in that weird middle gray area that nobody's put an acronym on yet. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. But if you're somebody who's purchasing managed services or security services from an IT firm, this is going to be a good conversation for you to listen to to understand how they're different, why they're different, and why you should pay attention, especially during the sales process and understanding what that looks like. So Gary, I know you just got back from a conference. So tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so we're out in uh, Nashville, um, about 1,800 attendees, most uh, most of the healthcare space. Um, met with a lot of uh, physicians groups, medical groups, you know, doctors, etc. Not too many IT folks there, um, but you know, there is a hyper focus now, obviously, on security, right? And and a lot of uh, doctors and owners of these groups came by and just said, "Hey, what's what's the deal here? Like, am I protected? Am I not protected?" I keep saying. <laughs> You know, all these things, seeing all these things going on, you know, with attacks and I talk to my IT folks, they say I'm fine, but am I? And I, and I think that's a great way to start the conversation, right? Because as you know, for, for many groups, especially smaller healthcare entities, the doctors don't know, right? That's just not their, 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 their they don't have the knowledge base to really understand, you know, what's required to secure them. I get it in larger groups, there's a CIO, CTO, you know, a, a CISO or someone in that virtual ro role and, and they have the knowledge to implement, you know, correct technologies. Um, but yeah, I think there's a lot of misunderstanding in this space right now, you know, with the, with the difference between IT and, and cyber and who does what and what are the correct technologies to have in place. And I thought, you know, AV or antivirus software stops ransomware. And well, now I have next gen antivirus. I thought that stopped ransomware. And I thought my firewall stopped ransomware. And it's just like, <laughs> you know, it's, it's this, this real circular conversation where everyone believes that they have kind of the, the magic pink unicorn in place that's just going to, you know, block anything and everything because it's next generation. Um, so I heard that term thrown around a lot at this meeting, which was very interesting mm -hmm. uh, because, yeah, it's next gen stuff's been around for a while, but then I started thinking, like, are they being promised things that may not function the way they think they're going to function, um, you know, in, yeah. <laughs> in stopping an attack, right? Or the big thing now is obviously the, the theft of, of uh, PII and EPHI, right? And none of that stuff's really going to stop that. So, you know, there's, it's, it's a bigger discussion. And then the backups came into discussion. You know, I think these are all you know, important things for us to, to discuss and, you know, help all of your uh, listeners understand as well. What, what do I really need in place? Who should be doing what, you know, and what are the, what are the risks? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's, there's so much involved with cybersecurity. Now you brought up antivirus and things like that. And, and it's, it seems like it wasn't that long ago when really, if you just threw any kind of off the shelf antivirus on the machine, that was good enough. Uh, exactly. And and it's like almost overnight, it seems, I know it's not, it's been a few years, but it seems like almost overnight that now it's you know when somebody comes to me and they're like yeah we've got antivirus i'm like okay <laughs> you know that's that's nothing right you know, you've got to have a whole lot more than that that's i, I like to tell people that's kind of like you, you know using the your front door of your house with all your valuables in it and you just have the lock that's on the doorknob you know you exactly. don't have a deadbolt or anything you just have the lock that's on the doorknob it's like great the door's locked but come on <laughs> yeah the 15 dollars home depot special right that you know a 10 year old kid will kick and the door will fly open. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, exactly. So I, you know, I think there's, there's still a tremendous amount of misunderstanding and even, you know, miscommunication going on in this industry right now, especially in healthcare mm -hmm. um, because of the folks that are typically purchasing this stuff, they're relying on, you know, what's being told by them. And sometimes the information that's being told to them is not always accurate. And it's, I don't think it's being done purposely, but, you know, I sat on a panel, uh, uh, a 
couple months back. And I remember this FBI agent saying something very telling. You know, uh, vendors are making promises on their technology that ultimately they're not going to be able to deliver on, right? So executives, practice owners, you know, group owners, things like that, all buy this technology, assuming that it's, i.e., ransomware proof, right? It'll stop ransomware. And then all of a sudden they turn around and they have ransomware or their backup devices can't be hit with ransomware, which we know there are some devices in, in concept, right? That, that can't be. Um, and then they turn around and they get hit. The devices weren't hit with ransomware, but the hackers broke into the backup device and erased all the data, right? So the statement stands, okay, you didn't get ransomware on that, you know, $3,000 backup solution, but the data's gone, right? You know, so, but for the, for the uneducated person, because this isn't their specialty, when they're being told that, hey, this thing's ransomware proof in your brain, right? You're the purchaser. You're like, okay, that sounds great. Give me that. Right. Yeah. So I think that that's still a challenge in, in, in this industry is, is the over promising of these technologies. I mean, just like you've heard, you're like, oh, it's multi-factor authentication enabled, or there's MFA enabled on this device. It can't be hacked. And then we turn around and we're like, oh, they bypassed MFA on this device and on this device now. And now we're just, you know, there's breaking news about MFA codes or SMS t text messages being intercepted, right? Millions or billions of them, you know, were, were leaked. Mm -hmm. So, you know, were those ever involved in, you know, MFA um, exploits, who knows, Yeah. you know, but, but, you know, these are the things that we have to think about as a, as a, you know, I'll call it as a, a society is when we're, we're betting the farm on one piece of technology to protect us, it's ultimately not going to work. Right. right. We, we know that everything can, can fail. Um, so I, I think we need to kind of discuss, you know, what MSPs typically provide, maybe where there's some overlap between an MSP and a cybersecurity firm. And then typically, you know, what cybersecurity firms can, can actually provide that MSPs either shouldn't or can't. Um, and I think that will help kind of craft, you know, the, the, where we are from a, from a security place uh, perspective, I should say, because both firms have a very critical role in, in protecting infrastructure. And that's mm -hmm. what it comes down to. We got to keep these practices and these groups running. Right. And, and I think if you lean all towards one side and you're just, you know, doing everything with a cybersecurity firm and you're missing the MSP stuff, that's a mistake. If you're you know, relying strictly on an MSP and you're forgetting about all the additional security layers that a cyber firm can layer in, I think that's a mistake too. So what I always lecture about is what's the happy balance? You know, wh where, where's, where's the tipping point, right? Where you're either too heavy on MSP services, right? Or, or too heavy on, on, on cyber. But I, I think that if we can get there today, I think it'd be huge for your, for your listeners. Sure. I like to think about, of course, I always bring everything kind of back to the a real world example. It's easier for people to kind of comprehend because a lot of this is, you know, a bunch of zeros and ones flying around. It doesn't make any sense. One of the ways I like to explain it is to say that IT and cybersecurity are very much like your first responders out there. So it's your, it's your police and your fire. So police and fire are quote unquote, fighting the same war on two different battlefields. So fire would be kind of like your, your IT folks. In fact, that's what we say when we have tons of tickets coming in, right? We're fighting fires all day long. <laughs> exactly. And, yeah. So you have your firefighters, which your, your IT, and then people that are protecting you, the police. Now they're kind of more in the cybersecurity realm. Now I like to add a third layer to that and say, well, look, you know, the military is also protecting you and they're kind of more special trained and and, you know, they have bigger guns and, and, and all this other stuff. And that's where you get into the true, just all they do is cybersecurity day in, day out. There's no true overlap. And so I say that to say that there are all, there are different levels of cybersecurity. So even when you get into that realm, that it can be very different, but that's, that's kind of the same. You, you could have somebody come in and, and especially if you have a house on fire, you may have the police and the fire show up because you could have a crime and you could have, you know, the fire that needs to be put out. Uh, but they're doing two different, very different roles. And you don't want them to uh, cross over. You don't want a fireman to show up when you, somebody's breaking in your house and you don't want only the police to show up if your house is on fire. And so you have to really understand who's coming and what skills they're bringing to the game. So in, a, in an MSP, let's talk about some of the, the things that you've ironed out. You had a slide that you showed me earlier, but let's talk about some of the things that you've pulled out to say this, these are the things that typically an MSP are going to focus on. And right. then let's look at the overlap and, and all that. 
Right. And, and this is going to be at a high level. So, you know, right. obviously there'd be other things that the MSP would provide where we're just not going to cover it. So I think the, the most common elements are firewall, right? Antivirus solution, um, secure email, hosted email, things like that. And then uh, backup solutions, right? I'll say that in plural, um, <laughs> uh, you know, so <laughs> for a very good reason, you know where I'm going with that, right? Yeah. Um, so I, I think the typical MSP is set up to deliver those types of solutions really, really well, right? And we're not going to talk about support and all that stuff. That's a given. But from a, from a security perspective, those are the, the four key elements that I, I, I believe MSPs do a really, really good job with. Um, so you want to kind of break those down in a little bit more detail? Uh, yeah, well, so let's get, let's do the backup thing. Everybody likes talking about backup, which, you know, my thing is I wish we would stop selling backup and start selling recovery, but I, I think we're a long way from that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's, it's amazing. I don't, I've never done a scientific study on, on this, but if I had to say how many people really know if their backup works, like it's recoverable, yep. I'm going with, I'm going with like 1%. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, I lectured uh, last night in front of a whole bunch of uh, healthcare entities, and I asked for a show of hands who's actually had their MSP attempt to recover all of their data and open all the data, not just bring it back to the system, but actually try and use it. And I had one hand, right? Okay. And, and that was it. And, and everyone else had nothing to say, right? Mm -hmm. And they just assume it's being done. You know, and, and, and the challenge here is a couple things. It doesn't always have to be a cyber event, as most people realize on this phone, uh, on this, uh, this, this uh, podcast. It could be flood, fire, natural disaster. And we got a call from a, a pretty sizable healthcare entity out of Minneapolis when the riots were going on. And the, the uh, executive from this org said, hey, they're, they're, you know, bashing windows and doors down left and right, just a block down for me. What do I need to do to get all my data out of here? So within, and this wasn't even a client of ours, right? It was just someone that called like 911, like, hey, how do I save my data, right? And we quickly in about five minutes helped them understand where their data was located. And they literally started ripping cables out of machines and throw them in the back of a, of a vehicle and they took off. And they came back to, have, to find their, their windows all smashed and their workstations gone, oh, right? Wow. But they were able to preserve all their data and their imaging data uh, just by making a quick decision. You know, so uh, look, I think there's, there's a lot more to these types of things than, you know, just what people think about right now, which is, you know, how do I protect my data and how do I secu secure my data, but what do I do in emergencies, right? Yeah. And, and, and it's a, that's another subject for another, another conversation. Um, but the, the backups are a big thing right now. Um, we're seeing a lot of these folks that when they get hit by these attacks, we go to restore the data, there is either no data there because the backup was not configured properly. I've seen throughout my career countless instances where MSP A hands off to MSP B, the handoff isn't done properly, right? And mm -hmm. there's no backup being done, right? Oh, I've yeah. seen external devices that have been set up to do backups. The uh, healthcare entity brings in a new EMR, EHR system, a new imaging system, et cetera. And those file sets forget aren't tagged, right? So you have an issue natural disaster or cyber event, for instance, no recoverable data. And then you have the hacking of these devices, right? We've, you know, we do incident response and digital forensics. And a lot of times healthcare entities will call us and say, hey, I have ransomware, but I have this backup and we know it works. Mm -hmm. And we get in there and we're like, okay, it did work, but there's no data there anymore. It's either encrypted or the data has gone for, for various reasons. And that, that does happen more frequently than most people realize. Uh, it also depends on the technology they're using and, and, and things like that. But I'm a big proponent of air gapping, right? Air gapping right. backups. It's an old school approach, right? You know, MSPs, and rightfully so, probably what, 10 years ago, do you think they started moving to all cloud backups? How long ago do you think? Yeah. I mean, you're, you're I mean all cloud. Yeah. Yeah. There was, yeah. it's funny because I got into doing cloud backups, which let's call them private cloud. In other words, the server is sitting in my office. <laughs> right. Yeah. But I actually got into that uh, back in the dial up days. Okay. Um, nice. Yeah. I mean, of course, you couldn't back up a ton of data. <laughs> right. There wasn't as much data then as there. It's proportional, yeah. right? You're yeah. right. You're right. But, um, but, but this concept of let's, let's back up the data automatically offsite through a, a piece of software 
and all that has actually been around for a, a very, very long time. I mean, I was doing this in, in the late, or I'm, I'm sorry, I was gonna say the late nineties, but I think it was probably the early two thousands. Right. Um, I mean, like literally 2000, 2001, we were doing this. So it's been around a long time, but yeah, now you can back up massive amounts of cloud data. Right. So, so previously I said, we got to talk about backups, plural, right? Cause mm -hmm. I believe that having a singular backup solution is, is a recipe for disaster, right? We're not going to go through the whole three, two, one concept right now, but you know, <laughs> what, what, what I, what I see, maybe we'll conceptually, but, but I tell um, you what, before, before we do this though, you yeah. mentioned air gapping. And I don't want, I yes. don't want to assume people understand what that is. So talk about that okay. for a second. Yeah, absolutely. So what I would, what I would love to see businesses do is start implementing this concept of air gapping. Air gapping basically means you back up your data and it's completely disconnected from a network right. conceptually, right? There's no internet access to that device, right? For smaller healthcare entities, it literally could be an external hard drive, right? That is literally sitting at someone's house or locked in a safe per se. Um, the concept here is, especially if you have multiple copies on that uh, device, the concept here is if the threat actors get into the system, Maybe they drop some hacking tools like Mimicats that can potentially grab usernames and passwords to various cloud backups, things like that. Let's just say worst case scenario, your cloud backups are compromised, the data on the servers and, and workstations compromised, and maybe even that local backup is compromised. If all of that's been compromised, the only thing that technically can save you now is that air gapped backup that has no network accessibility. Right. Mm -hmm. So you're going to bring that device online, whether it's you know on the network or it's a physical device that's been disconnected, bring it back online on a, a, a network that has never been touched before, i.e., you know, a, a new network that's been set up on a, a se separate network. You never want to bring that data on the hit network because odds are, you know, if you don't know what's going on, the threat actors are still in the system and they'll just hit the data again or steal the data. Right. Um, right. So you know, this, this is a really powerful concept. And if you start looking at what even Fortune 500 companies are doing, they've gone back to this methodology, right? And, and a lot of MSPs will say, oh, that's like old school, who the heck does that anymore? Like, it, just back everything up to the cloud. But some of the things that uh, the MSPs don't think about, and, and especially the clients don't think about is, A, the loss of the data, like we just described. Mm -hmm. But the big mm -hmm. problem that we see as a cybersecurity firm during the recovery phase of an attack is how long does that data take to come back from the cloud? This a is a major time. issue. Oh, absolutely. If you look at healthcare entities that do a lot with uh, digital imaging, like x-rays, photographs, CT scans, MRIs, all this stuff, these images are huge. And, and anything that uses uh, DICOM imaging, like x-rays and, and 3D imaging, especially CAT scans and MRIs, like one MRI or CT scan could have hundreds and hundreds of DICOM images. And we know how, you know, restoring data typically works. It's like send one file, check it, right? Then request another file. And it just goes back and forth, literally tens of millions of times sometimes with these larger healthcare entities and these backups, right? I'm sorry, these recovery efforts could take five, six days to bring the data back from the cloud. And the other thing that I've seen is the MSP will say, well, look, if we need to get you large data sets back, we'll burn it to a hard drive, right? And we'll overnight you the hard drive. So everyone's like, okay, that sounds great. Sure, I'll get my data back in a day, but it doesn't quite work that way, as you know, right? <laughs> no, so right. you got to write all that massive amount of data to the drive. And just like I described before, there's a tremendous amount of read write going on. And we've literally seen that process take 24 hours to write large data sets to external drives. Um, then if you miss the shipping, you know, cut off for FedEx or UPS could be another day. So in the best case scenario, 48 hours, but I will tell you what we've typically seen is three ish to four days, even with an external hard drive being sent. Yeah. Now, it's it's kind of like the, it's kind of like the Amazon two day delivery thing, right? <laughs> it's two yep. day delivery from when they ship it, not from when you order it. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Right. Order, order it Saturday afternoon and you're not getting it until Tuesday anyway. Yeah. Right. So, so yeah, it's, so they'll overnight you a drive, but it doesn't mean you'll get it overnight from the time you ordered it right. you'll get it overnight from the time they shipped it <laughs> right and then on top of it david you know what happens when you get the drive now you got to copy all the contents off so yeah. right so this this the the reality is it's probably not that much faster by getting a physical drive when, when you really timeline this out and we've done this a whole bunch of times maybe they say it save a day um, we've also had scenarios where 
these backup companies who call them on a Saturday or Sunday and they're like, yeah, we just don't have the people here to do all this especially if there's a larger scale attack that's impacting multiple businesses. Mm -hmm. uh, so case in point, right, when MSPs get hit, unfortunately, it's a horrific situation. Yeah. And they're all using the same backup solution. Now, 200 of their clients are demanding external hard drives. Whoa, how, how, how do most backup companies deal with something like that? I mean, it's just, it's a disaster. Right. You know, um, you know we, had, we had one situation where the, uh, the, the practice got hit, the data center didn't have enough remote hands. Right. The MSP had to drive, you know, a person two and a half hours away to the data center to physically bring a drive and hook it up and run the backup. Right. I mean, it's it's tough. And then literally camp out there overnight waiting for the data to, to, to be burned to the drive. And then, you know, the next day at the end of the day, overnight, that drive. So we we're still looking at a three day process to get the drive and then another day to copy it. So, like I said, it's, it's still a four day issue. Yeah. Um, first, taking that external drive. Right. That you've been. Uh, copying your data to every night and bringing it back into the, the business and restoring, you know, from there, you know, but we still have the issue of the data theft with these cyber attacks. So, you know, I, I, I think that's another discussion, which is backups are great, but if all your data is stolen by the hackers, right. It, it, it's uh, a partial solution. And that's, you know, a, a good segue in terms of why businesses and practices really need to be hardening their security, not just relying strictly on backups. I think that's a recipe for disaster. Everything we're seeing right now, close to, I'll say 90% of all the victims of ransomware have their data stolen. It's very rare we don't see data theft in these, in these cases. Yeah. Now, it yeah. is worth pointing out, too, that air gap is great. Now, there's mm -hmm. some comp complexity with air gapping uh, because yeah. now you're starting to rely more on humans and there's more failure to that, but also yeah. organizations need to do a risk analysis on this as well, because now you're taking data that, you know, was, was on site and it's going to the cloud. And now you're moving that data. Maybe potentially you're moving it off site and somebody's physically carrying a drive around, <laughs> Yep. you know, and they are leaving the drive in the car and the car is getting it broken into. So there's a, there's some risk involved there and they have to certainly understand how to handle that data that's now moving outside of the organizational uh, physical walls as well as digital walls. Absolutely. There's accountability. So one thing I probably should have mentioned and, and probably you're going down this path as well, encrypt the hard drive, right? Before any data gets copied to that hard drive, that, that the hard drive itself has to be physically encrypted, right? It has to be, have a container on it that's encrypted. So to your point, someone dumps, you know, 500, you know, gigs of data, or a couple of terabytes of data, these external devices and it's stolen. We got a problem, right? There's a risk that you didn't have prior, but if it's encrypted, I think we can all agree that hard drive encryption for the most part is final. You're not, you know, unless it's a really weak password, you're not getting into that drive. Yeah. So, yeah. And, and just, and just to your point, we had a client uh, two weeks ago that called and, and they, their building was physically broken into. And of all things, they grabbed uh, the, the NAS, which is where all the data was, because it's a small organization, they didn't need a server. <laughs> you know, fortunately, we have all the data backed up and all that. That's not the issue. The issue is that, is that now the NAS, the network attached storage drive that has all their data on it is now gone. Now, fortunately for us, and to your point, it's, it's encrypted. We're not worried about it. Um, but that just goes to show with all the cybersecurity we have in place, Somebody can still walk in and grab the data physically and walk out with yeah. it. <laughs> Look, I mean, there's, there's, you know, this, this concept of attack surface, right? Understanding where you're vulnerable and, and dealing with those types of risks. I think a lot of organizations struggle with that, right? Because they're not doing a security risk assessment. They don't actually know where they're vulnerable. You know, if you're doing kind of like your, your fireman analogy, everyone's looking over there, right? Trying to put the fire out over there, but the building's really burning down over here. And, and, without a security risk assessment and understanding where you're going to get hit or potentially hit, you're not going to be able to address the threats. And I think that's a big problem right now. People are spending money in the wrong places or they're just throwing money at a problem and they may be throwing the money in the wrong place. And I, I think that's a major, a major issue. And businesses have to have a security risk assessment done by, by a cyber firm to understand where they have risk and, and how to address those threats and what types of technologies can can help mitigate those types of risks because there is no there's no cookie cutter solution and I kind of feel that that's what's going on right now. Everyone's like, well, throw next gen antivirus software, throw you know endpoint detection and response software. Okay, that's all great until you re you realize that your remote access to your system is garbage, right? How, how how's any of that going to help you 
in this type of situation, they'll steal your data, they'll hit you with, they'll just deliver ransomware right through your remote, you know, you know, uh, control session. Mm -hmm. So your remote access. So, you know, to my point, there, there's more to, to security than just tools. And I, and I think that's where there's also kind of a, the, the path kind of splits between, you know, what MSPs do and, and, and what cybersecurity companies can do is they can really come in, you know, use highly trained individuals to conduct these assessments, um, work with these organizations to, to help them understand where they have risk and then recommend solutions to, to basically mitigate that stuff, to, to close those quote unquote open doors and windows and do it effectively. Right. You know, so. so let's talk about the security risk analysis some, because that's kind of a, a pet peeve of mine. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, but before we do that, we're, we're talking about IT and cybersecurity being separate. And you mentioned throwing money at things. Now, one thing that I rarely see, and it drives me a little crazy, but I understand it from a client's perspective, they don't know yet, but I see IT and cybersecurity lumped together in their spending. And it's, it's almost shocking how many times I'll ask somebody, what is your budget for IT? And what is your budget for cybersecurity? They're not, they don't even have a budget for IT. Right. It's like, you know, and they're looking at me like, what do you mean budget for IT and cybersecurity? Aren't they the same? No, they're not the same. What, and you might be in a situation where you're going to have to pick one. Like, do you want firefighting or do you want police? You can't have both at, at your budget. Right. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, it's, but, but you know, the funny part is David, they'll have the budget after they have a ransomware attack. Oh yeah. Every time, <laughs> the, every time. the money, the money magically appears, right? You, you know, that a hundred percent, right? I, I yeah. see it every single time. Well, I always, um, I tell people when I come in, when they tell me they don't have a budget, I say, my name is Paul. So you need to find out which Peter you're going to rob to pay Paul. <laughs> right. Yeah, the risk is too high. You know, um, I mean, that's a, that's a whole other uh, podcast discussion. Yeah. Um, but look, businesses have to do it. Yeah. It, it's the cost. You know, I, I, I said this a couple of years ago. It's the cost of doing business. If you want to operate in the digital world right now, if you want to be connected, and you're not investing in, in good MSP services and good cybersecurity services, ultimately you're gonna fail. We, mm -hmm. we all know that, right? Because the, the, there's too many ways to get into these networks and there's too many failure points. And you know, like we've been talking about, you don't understand where you're gonna fail, you're gonna fail. Yeah, right? well, that's, it, that's, that's, it's, that's the problem. It's very similar to me saying, um, I run a business, I'm gonna handle my own accounting and bookkeeping. I might be able to do a okay job of some of that, but I'm not going to be good enough as to, to, to replace a, an actual bookkeeper and accountant. And so there's going to be failures there. I could, I can go represent myself in court if I want to, it's not a good idea. Um, and there's going to be some problems with that. Uh, it, it's the same thing in the professional services we're talking about now. Some people think they can do their own it stuff and they can cobble together a network and they can make things quote unquote work. But that's that's very different than a professional that can come in and do these things. Uh, mm -hmm. Let's talk a little bit about the, the security risk analysis there. Yep. So so this is something we do for 100 percent of our clients um, and it is variable. So what do we mean by that? It, it depends on the industry they're in. Right. It depends on the size of the organization, a security risk uh, assessment or analysis, depending on the, the terminology you want to use for an organization with 10 computers is way different than obviously an organization with 10,000 computers, mm -hmm. right? You're talking something that may take a couple hours on the lower end to something that could take a couple of weeks to conduct properly, um, simply because the attack surface is very different in those types of environments. If you look at, let's take a healthcare analogy, you look at say a plastic surgeon, right? With six computers in her office, her attack surface is gonna be small conceptually, mm -hmm. right? You know, you have, entry points, maybe remote access, you have some vendors, maybe you have, um, you know, consultants, MSP access, uh, things like that. Tax surface can be looked at, analyzed, and, and most of those holes can be plugged accordingly. Then you look at a, a large organization, a large physicians group, a hospital, well, they have 30 locations, they're all VPN together, there's 30 different firewalls, there's remote access, there's imaging, there's prescription writing, right? There's all these different technology labs, right? All these different uh, systems that are interconnected and each one of those presents risk to the organization. Um, so what we like to do is we'll scale our SRA, security risk analysis or assessment based on the size of the org. Like on the lower end of the spectrum, 
it might be an hour and a half to two hours, maybe a little longer. And typically we're asking them about 125-ish questions. And the nice thing about what we do is they're all done by our security engineers. These are CIS uh, PP folks, right, with actual credentials. And it's not textbook. It's not meaning uh, we ask these questions, the answers are yes, no, and we go to the next one. What, what happens here is we like to say we go down rabbit holes with our clients, mm -hmm. right? They'll mm -hmm. answer, yes, we do this. And the security folks will say, okay, well, tell us why you're doing that and what technology you're using. And based on those answers, we're going to then in a report explain to them, hey, you're doing it well, or hey, listen, let's move away from this technology and go down this path instead, because there's too much risk if you're using this, you know, free, you know, RDP access, right, with no MFA and no VPN and all these other horrible things people still do. Um, or they're using the free version of a remote control software, uh, you know, with no MFA and no strong password uh, enforcement, you know, so these types of things. Um, really help reduce the risk for the organization. And a lot of these things, David, like they don't cost the org typically anything, mm -hmm. right? It, it's it's uh, best practices, you know, SOPs, you know, th things like that, that these, these orgs need to, to implement. Um, and as we move closer to the, you know, to the larger end of the spectrum, we may say, hey, you need to have a NIST, right? Um, assessment. Uh, the, the problem with a lot of these higher end assessments, these frameworks, they're expensive. Yeah, you know, yeah. so for for a small or even a, a medium sized healthcare org, it may not be possible with their current budget. Um, so our feeling is based on our experiences, our security guys' firsthand knowledge of prevention and incident response, we can you know fine tune these assessments and really get some solid information in in uh, a shorter amount of time. Mm -hmm. um, but organizations they have to do this. Right. Regardless of the scale, they have to do it. You can't just be like, hey, throw EDR software, you know, extend detection and response or XDR software on the network and walk away and hope for the best. Yes, yeah. that's that's, yeah. that's not effective security. That's a, that works to a degree. But in the end, you're still probably going to have some type of problem. Yeah. So. I mean, if you don't know where your risks are, it's it's very difficult to protect. It, it's almost like you know, if you don't know where the data is that, you know, anymore, we're not really looking to protect users or endpoints we're trying to protect the data, absolutely, which is, which is very, very different. You know, we've moved away from protecting endpoints. We still talk about protecting endpoints, but ultimately we need to look at protecting that data, wherever it's at, wherever it lives, however it moves around. And, and that can be very different, especially with all the work from home, because now the data has completely just started going everywhere. And, right. uh, and most organizations have no idea where the data is. So, so to your point, um, two weeks ago, we got a call from a uh, healthcare entity, not one of our clients that said, hey, we, we think we have a problem here. Um, the practice administrator walked by one of the employee's desks and noticed she had a Dropbox open. So she was smart enough to realize, whoa, what, why is this employee using Dropbox from the office? So when the employee left, she sat down at her computer and found a ton of patient data on it. This employee also works remotely. Okay. So she wasn't when they when I, they brought her to the table in front of the doctors and the administrator and said, what what are you doing with our data? Why are you putting on Dropbox? She's like, well, I work from home two days a week, so it was just easier for me to, to manage my work that way. It wasn't the HIPAA compliant version of Dropbox. You know, it was a, it was a free account. Um, she had signed a policy stating, you know, she would not take you know any any data and they terminated her on the spot. Um, in the end, she wasn't doing anything malicious. But to your point, where's my data? Mm -hmm. You know, and that, mm -hmm. and in the end, when that goes sideways, that's eh, probably not going to be on her. It's going to be on the, the group, right? The practice. They're going to own oh, that yeah. breach because of her mistake, right? Absolutely. And look, the practice tried to do the right thing in, in their defense by saying you're not allowed to do it. And she knew it, but she did it anyway. You know, so, you know, is, is there the ability to block that kind of stuff and restrict it and, and maybe enhance the training? You know what happens? These, the, the employees, they sign a document. They don't even know what they're signing. They don't read it. You know, but maybe if they had done training, which they admitted they had not, they didn't have a formal, hey, you can't do this. Mm -hmm. They assume that everyone is reading and would follow the rules, but we know how that works. Yeah. yeah. So. Well, it also goes back to why can't, you know, why can't I do this to solve this problem? Uh, because I, I do it at home. I do it here. I, you know, this goes back to, I can make it work. I mean, that worked. Yeah for her. It did work. Yeah. I mean, it probably worked great actually, if you think about it, <laughs> but you know, just, and that's just it. People don't understand just because you can do it. Doesn't mean you should. 
Um, and I, you know, I see this a lot too. People using you know, free stuff that doesn't fall under the the BAA for that organization uh, or or the vendor even, and they'll do it. They do it with uh, Microsoft, with Google products, and, and Jotform, and all these other products. There, you know, I use the free version. I don't need the paid version. <laughs> no, you have no to have the paid version. Um, it, yeah. But uh, yeah, it's it's a big problem, but. Um, but back to the to the SRA, I know some organizations are probably saying, I'm small. I don't know that I can afford an SRA. And I'm not asking you for necessarily a price, but what, what's a range that somebody could expect if they're, uh, you know, 10 computers or 20 computers, you know, they're in the really small range of, uh, of business size. Yeah. I mean, if, if you're a really small healthcare entity, for instance, or a small business, um, you know, a, an SRA with maybe a hundred questions done by, you know, a CISP level person with a report, 1500 ish bucks and up, you know, depending on, on, uh, you know, the scope of it, uh, they can go up to, as you know, $7,500,000 for, for larger organizations. Um, but for, for small entities, I mean, that's a good starting point if they don't mm -hmm. have crazy needs. You know, we, we do come across some small entities that have all these connections to different things. And you're like, well, you are small, but your risk is pretty big because of everything that's going on. You know, how far do you want to go with this? And, and that's, that's what happens sometimes as well as you start uncovering things that the practice didn't even realize was a risk, yeah. you know, and that you have to dig a little deeper, you know, third party risk is becoming a big thing, which we don't really have time to talk about. But I think that's, that's the next big move here is who outside of my organization is going to put me at risk. Yeah. The big value in this too is, especially if you're an MSP, and this is probably where you see some contention, but I like the fact that a third party organization is looking over my shoulder to see where I might have either dropped the ball, or I just didn't even realize that something wasn't configured properly, or we didn't address a risk that was there for whatever reason. Um, there, there's something inherently I hate to say wrong, but <laughs> about uh, an MSP assessing their own work. Yeah, I mean it's you know it's just, it, you're not going to find the problems if you if you thought you could find the problems you would have found them in the first place or you would never have done them in the first place. Right. It. I, I think what you just said is really the number one problem in, in this industry right now. Is if you think about it, this really needs to be a team effort. Right. Mm -hmm. This is the MSP working with the healthcare org or the small business along with the cyber firm. And, and, and to your point, this concept of a true third party, second set of eyes, whatever terminology you wanna to use to assess risk, it just has to be done. And, and MSPs shouldn't feel that it's like someone looking under the hood and gonna critique them, right? If that's how you feel about your organization, I think you're looking at it the wrong way. You should look at it just like you said, David, which is, all right, I, I'm fine with this. Like, I know my organization does a great job, but I would love to have a second set of eyes on this because I have employees that could make a mistake. I could make a mistake as the, you know, the owner of the MSB, for instance, and I don't want that on my shoulders. And, to, to, and in the end, let's be honest here, right? If, if a client gets breached, the MSP doesn't own that, right? That's that's kind of on the client. They'll help them, right? I've seen that all the time. They'll, they'll do whatever they can to help the client, but they're not paying all the bills, mm -hmm. right? Associated with that. So, you know, this whole team approach, I think is, is so critical. And you know what we found when we've done some of these SRAs, especially when it's combined with a technical assessment, mistakes a level one tech support person made, right? Or a configuration on a firewall, or sometimes the client inserts risk themselves by putting something on the network that the MSP isn't even tracking and that causes the breach, you know, so these types of ongoing um, assessments, ongoing vulnerability management, you know, things like that, they play a really, really important role in, you know, protecting these organizations. Um, I'm a firm believer of the SRA, but I'm also a believer that these technical assessments, these vulnerability tests, these pen tests, things like that, they have to be ongoing. I can't tell you how many times we'll test a firewall for an MSP this month, right? And next month we find vulnerabilities on it. And the MSP is like, we didn't touch it. How's that? I don't understand. How could there be vulnerabilities on that firewall now? Well, there's lots of variables there. It's mm -hmm. a human issue, right? Someone opened something on the firewall to let a vendor in to install some software or whatever to make something work. They didn't know. It could be out of date operating systems. It could be a whole new threat. 
look what's happened over the last year with all these vulnerabilities on these firewalls. We've seen businesses that have literally been hit with ransomware attacks because they didn't patch their firewall vulnerabilities. Yeah. Right? And they, they, they never did an assessment, an ongoing assessment really to determine whether that, that, that would impact them. They had all this other stuff in place, but their most important thing to protect their, you know, their, their pot of gold was open. Mm-hmm. You know, so I, I do believe like this SRA combined with vulnerability management and, and, and external pen testing for smaller orgs and even internal pen testing for larger orgs, this, this has to be part of um, what you do as an organization. It's the part of, it, it's the cost of doing business. And if you haven't budgeted 20, for 2021, some have, some haven't, you need to think about it for 2022, right? That's, that's gotta be a line to back to your, you know, opening, almost your opening statement, David, which is. You got to you got you to gotta budget for both now, right? You can't run a healthcare org and not have security in place because the cost of a breach is, is insane. And and the other thing for another another, another discussion is insurance, <laughs> right? They're saying now forty percent of of businesses, uh, including healthcare, won't be able to get cyber coverage in twenty twenty two to twenty twenty three. Forty percent, especially if you've had an existing claim. So now what are you going to do? You're not going to invest in security. You're going to buy insurance. You're going to get hit. And you're one and done. It's kind of like homeowners insurance. Usually you'll get dropped, right? And then what are businesses going to do? You run a potentially multi-million dollar healthcare org and you can't get cyber coverage. You get hit, you watch that organization disappear, right? They're not going to be able to pay the bills. You yeah. know, so uh, that, that's why all these, all these things that we've been talking about today are so important, not only for right now, but you got to think long-term with this stuff, right? This isn't, you know, the, the, this isn't a, uh, you know, a, a, a I'm not trying to say it's not, we have to, we have to think big picture, not small picture. Right. So. Uh, one last question. We'll wrap up. Do you okay. have, you, we mentioned budgeting. What are you yeah. seeing as far as if, if an organization says, well, I don't know what I should be budgeting. Do you have a, a range of percentage of, of gross uh, revenue they should be uh, throwing at these things? Look, I think, you know, some big companies, spend 10% on this stuff. I don't think that's realistic for smaller healthcare orgs, to be frank. Mm-hmm. You know, if a smaller healthcare orgs, you know, uh, making a million dollars a year to do 10%, 100,000 on just security, that's probably a big spend. Uh, maybe half that between, uh, and you you would know more on the MSP side, what, what people are paying now. Mm-hmm. But I'll, I'll give you the, um, the cyber end. If you're, say, under 20 computers, for instance, on your, in your environment, if you budgeted six, $7,000 a year just for dedicated cyber, which is like vulnerability, pen testing, assessments, um, cybersecurity awareness training for your staff. That's, that's going to be a solid number there. And then what, what do you think, David, for, for MSP services? What, what would, what would that look like? And then maybe we'll just combine the numbers. Yeah. I mean, typically we're seeing uh, on the IT support side, um, probably somewhere in the five to 8% range. So so close, close to the same, really. It just, it just okay. depends on how the MSP has structured because some of them, uh, for example, an organization may want to do more of an ad hoc, you know, we'll, we'll pay you when we call you. Some of them do, uh, you know, every, all you can eat pricing is, is what is, is popular, um, which is expensive, um, but it keeps your costs from running crazy. Uh, and then some MSPs don't offer either one. They just say, you know, we're going to only do, or you can eat remote support, but if we come on site, we're going to charge you. So it can, it can vary a lot, but you know, certainly uh, an organization needs to look at how much is it going to cost me over time. And I would say the, the first year, maybe even less, you should be able to sit down with your MSP and, and really map out what it is truly costing you and then look at, okay, maybe we're paying too much in it support. We can shift some of that money to cybersecurity or vice versa, but you, you definitely need to be sitting down and looking at where you are, where you want to go and, and move that needle a little bit if you need to. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I think, you know, it, going back to what you talked about, kind of this quote unquote original concept, I, I would say if we had to group things in, in summary here, I would say MSP, typically firewall, AV, backups, uh, secure email, hosted email, things like that. Get away from on-site email. It's a disaster right now. <laughs> uh, like utter disaster. I, I don't even want to get into that conversation. And then on the other side of the spectrum is, you know, 
start looking for cyber firms that are going to provide some more advanced services like vulnerability management against your firewall, vulnerability management against all of your devices on the inside of your network. Mm -hmm. um, training, which could go either way, I could argue MSP or, or cyber firm. Um, some type of extended detection and response, you know, AI technology that helps identify the fingerprints of an attack. Uh, and one of the most important things, you know, that you brought up is this SRA, the security risk assessment. I mean, those, you know, this group of items uh, that I just described, that, that really needs to be done by a cyber firm. So, yeah. Well, Gary, thanks for joining us. As always, yeah. I, we could probably sit here and talk all day about all this stuff. <laughs> we absolutely could. <laughs> we we'll, absolutely we'll nerd could. out for hours, right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, thanks again. And uh, for those who want to uh, reach out to you, how can they get in touch with you? Sure. Uh, from a web perspective, Black Talon, T A L O N, security.com. Uh, you can also um, chat with us on our website, uh, email. Uh, sales at blacktownsecurity.com uh, or 800 numbers right on our website. You can pull it from that as well. So Sweet. That'd be the best way. All right. Great conversation, Gary. Thanks for joining me as my co-host today. And uh, remember for Gary and myself, HIPAA is not about compliance. It's about patient care.